Here we go. So we are doing our presentation today on uh, the no see do process in effective and having effective coaching cycles using the no see do process. And so here's our um, agenda for you today. And we're just gonna, like we've been doing, welcome everybody. We're gonna understand the no see do process. We're gonna look deeper at each step, look at coaching cycles using the no see do process, some resources, and then we'll have time for questions. And we really like to have things a little bit more interactive than this, but we weren't exactly sure what we would be able to do inside of this platform. And so we weren't able to do breakout sessions, but we will be doing some whiteboard activities. So be ready for that. So here's us, Deb, go ahead and introduce yourself. Well, my name is Debbie Parnoblet and I am a child development specialist with the Stanislaus County Office of Education. Currently I'm a QRIS QCC coach and I provide training, I provide technical assistance. We um, coaches at Stanislaus County Office of Education are uh, class and, and ERS certified and provide assessments to sites. We're not doing that right now due to um, COVID-19 limitations, but um, we provide right now virtual coaching, training and so forth to our participants using that platform. Thank you so much for, for coming to our, our session today. We're excited to share with you what we've learned about no see do. Thank you, Debbie. My name is Audra Coburn and Debbie and I work in the same office. We actually work under the same grant for the Quality Counts California grant, working specifically with the quality rating improvement system, which she uh, named as QRIS. And we work with uh, lots of different providers. We work with state preschool, we work with federally funded Head Start, we work with uh, braided programs, which means their funds are braided together. We work with state migrant programs, we work with family child care homes, we work with family friend and neighbor. So we do, and private centers, so whether that's private faith-based or just a private center in the community, we work with all types of providers. And we really um, focus on that early learning and care, so birth to five years old, and that's uh, our focus. We're both uh, certified in practice-based coaching and also in class group coaching, and class is an acronym for the classroom assessment scoring system, which really looks at effective teacher-child interactions. And so um, that's a little bit about us. We're really glad to be here today. So today we're going to learn about three new things. And this process that we're going to be learning about is called no see do. So the very first step in the process is to know. And simply put, that is when we use print materials to know about a specific concept that we want to teach. And the second part of that is to see. So how we do that as coaches is we use video or observation to see the concept in action. The third step is do, setting a SMART goal of how we want to do or implement these concepts in our classroom. So let's take a look at no. We like to use data from developmental assessments to drive and inform the selection of our concept. So we do that by completing DRDP, we do observations, and we use that data to identify a needed concept for the group of children that we're working with. And then knowing is such a crucial and foundational step to the no see do pro process as it provides the information needed to the teacher so that they are able to implement the concept to, to the children in a meaningful way. Third, narrowing down to a specific concept even within a concept sometimes will support that intentional planning. 
So once you've narrowed it down to what you want to teach, then you can make have an idea of how you want to approach that the activities that you're going to use with the children. And then as a coach on the fourth step, we are going to provide meaningful articles, blog posts, lectures, maybe even resource books on math activities or um, whatever the concept is that we're going to be teaching to support further, con further understanding of the concept for the teaching staff so that they're able to provide meaningful activities. Next slide. C. So this C portion is where you see an activity in action. So once you have the foundation of no, um, and you know about the concept uh, from, what, from what you've selected from data, seeing it in action promotes further understanding, sort of an aha, like, ah, that's something that I can do. And uh, it really helps you identify how you can go about doing that. The second part is from watching that video or picture or that visual, you are able to develop and make those simple adjustments for your group or maybe some children that you need to have provide some special support. Third, seeing provides a visual for you and the, your teaching team in your classroom. And they can look at that and actually emulate it or um, practice it from what they have seen. And that fourth step it supports lesson planning because you can see what idea is being presented to you in the video and you can write it down and document it and uh, make it black and white so everybody can be on the same page about implementing the activity. Audra, will you take the next one? I will. So Debbie's talked us through the know. We need to know the concept before we can teach it. And then she's talked us through the C section. And sometimes it's kind of like when somebody's explaining something to you and then when they show it to you on paper, like they're trying to explain a drawing to you and then they show it to you on paper. It's like, oh, I get what you mean now. And that's really what that C piece is. And then here we get to the do part. And when we get to the do part, it's the actual implementation of the lesson. But we really want that teacher or that provider to be setting a goal for him or herself. And that way um, they know exactly what they're gonna do with those. So it's specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. And so um, we want them to use a SMART goal for how they're gonna implement that concept into their learning environment. The set, so the first thing is to be specific. So be specific about what your concept will develop, indicating where and when you will implement the concept. Sometimes, Teachers can get really excited. Um, educators can just want to teach the entire, um, you know, science of the atom, and and it's just too much. So if we can go in small incremental steps, it becomes specific for the teacher. It becomes specific for the students, and it um, provides a, a very uh, narrow lane for them to to be within. So it's not overwhelming um, because. When you want to do everything, it can be frustrating to people when they just need to know something a little bit more specific. And then you want to make your goal measurable. So can you count how many times the activity was engaged or how many students participated? Uh, you can also, if you have data that you're um, showing progress in a specific area, that data could work as well. But as far as your goal with the actual provider or the teacher, um, you know, how can that person measure that so that you can see the success of that? So fourth is your goal attainable. So have you set it so broad that you're never going to get to it? You're never going to be able to meet it within your time frame, or 
it's going to be too much for the students to take. You need to chunk and chew, right? Chunk it out a little bit more so that they can chew it up a little bit better. Um, is it relevant? Does it align with your agency's goals for your program? Does it align with the data that shows where your uh, students are at in that specific uh, content area? And then you want to set a time frame to complete your goal. Make it time bound. And we always encourage our providers to set their goals short term, one to three months, even, you know, two to three, two to four weeks is even better sometimes, just depending on what it is. But I don't know about you guys, but when we started coaching um, in our, with our grant five years ago, people had gone into the classroom and in the name of coaching had monitored the teachers and given them a list of what they had to correct and fix. And that really brought a whole lot of hesitancy for coaching. And so we had to reset what coaching meant, that framework. And so as we began to do that, when we set those small goals and they begin to see themselves be wildly successful in two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, it really helped us um, kind of um, improve engagement. And it also gave them more ex excitement towards the coaching. And then the teacher, then as we're pointing out their strengths, they're getting excited and then they're just ready to go on another concept right away. And so we found that that time bound, the shorter the time, the better for the, the provider or the educator because it does excite them and keep them engaged. So I wanna to talk to you about a coaching cycle. And I was, as I was looking at the, the slides that we prepared, it hit me today that this is kind of like directions for shampoo. You wanna lather, you wanna rinse, and you wanna repeat. And so um, visit one is our, is our lather, right? So we wanna identify those agency goals. What has my agency said that as an agency, we wanna focus on these things? And then I want to um, choose a concept that's gonna meet that goal. And then when I do that, I'm gonna create my SMART goal with my implementation steps because I can create this, the goal, but how am I gonna meet that goal? I need some implementation steps. And then um, once the coachee has done that as the coach, I'm gonna email her things. I'm gonna email her articles or links to lectures or um, books that she can read or resources that will help her complete the activity within the classroom and the time frame. So I'm gonna do that first. And then in my next visit, um, oh, and I'm going to provide her also with those C materials. So show her some videos of people actually performing those tasks within the, the content area and within the same type of environment. And so we're going to look at that C. And then visit two, I'm going to spend an hour video recording the educator in action and looking for specific implementation steps to find. And sometimes you can go into a classroom and the educator has set up the activity, they know you're coming and you still don't see any implementation steps. Well, then you're just gonna be looking for strengths, right? How are they engaging with the children? What things did they present? Um, what kind of feedback loops did they have? How, uh, how engaged were the children in the activity? What, you know, and things like that. And so you're wanting to look for those uh, positive things, those strengths that you see. And then you wanna take those video clips that you've had of watching this educator in action and you wanna narrow them down. Choose like, three to five clips, that's plenty. And you wanna narrow those down to about 30 to 90 seconds per piece. So if you have an iPad or an iPhone, really easy to um, clip videos down and segment them so that you have just what you need. And that way you can show the implementation. One of the things I constantly carry with me is I have this little flash drive. I don't know if I can show it to you because my screen's blurred out. But um, I have a flash drive that has the um, iPhone and uh, iPad uh, little, connector at the bottom and it's a flash drive. So it takes all of my videos and puts them. So if I can't show them on my device, I can plug it into their computer and show them the videos and the things that I've recorded of them and their effectiveness. And then I wanna use those reflective prompts. So I, we, uh, Gustavo talked about that earlier today in effective coaching, but when we're using reflective prompts, we really want to help elicit perspective from the provider. So, you know, what did, what did you find interesting? What do you think the children found interesting? Um, how did that work for you? How did you feel doing that? Uh, what do you think the children felt like? And um, things like that. And then we want to go ahead and uh, facilitate vision. So where else could you use this activity? What other places in the classroom could you um, integrate this concept? And so we really wanna facilitate vision. And then strength and knowledge. Let's think about this and how you could strengthen it. How can you make it even better than it was? 
And so uh, those reflective, reflective prompts are really great and important. And then you wanna update your implementation steps, adjust your goal, or set a new goal as needed. So if the teacher has met some implementation steps but still has some left to do, you wanna go ahead and note the things that she's done and leave the ones that aren't, and, and ask her or him, um, you know, ask the provider, what else do you need to complete this goal if it wasn't completed in your first round? Um, what other steps do you need to take? What else do you think you could do to be successful at this? And sometimes you have to adjust the goal altogether because it's just not working. It's not working the way the provider thought it was going to. And then you want to, now that you've lathered, you've rinsed, and now you're going to repeat. So you want to repeat that visit um, back to that second visit where you're videotaping, you're looking for implementation, you're reflecting, and then you're adjusting and, and going from there. So lather, rinse, and repeat. <laughs> So now let's talk about data a little bit more <laughs> and um, using data kind of with our observations and our relationship with the children is critical to excellent planning. So as we, you know, aim for excellence in our work, we look to data to help us. Now, one form of data that we use in early childhood programs that are state funded is the developmental uh, profile summary of findings. So what we do is we actually pull reports either from where we've entered our data, be it um, DRDP online or Learning Genie, we can pull our data and then determine where the needs are. For example, from a report, we were able to determine that uh, the measure of COG3 number, sense, and quantity what was showed that 48% of the children in this classroom are at building earlier and are at the, at the end of the very first collection. And so that means that this classroom or this agency is on a schedule of when they pull data, when they, when they enter the data, when they pull it, and when they follow up so that we can measure how those activities benefited the children, what the outcome is. So we are projecting a goal of 80% of the preschoolers in the next action step section, a goal of 80% of the preschoolers will reach building middle, which is the next step on the developmental profile by the final collection. So how are we gonna do that? Uh, a couple of the activities that we chose because it reflects the DRDP, is the developmental profile is to use that one-to-one -one correspondence for daily activities such as counting boys and girls in attendance, number of blocks in a structure, items on a number card, etc. Another way would be to recite, recite one to 10, counting one to 10 twice during soapy water hand rub when we're hand washing. Right now during COVID, we do have to, to do a lot of hand washing in our early childhood programs. So we're using that to help with our number sense and quantity. So we make this plan based on what we see from the data and we know our children, we have a relationship with them we know what they like. They like that one-to-one -one correspondence of activities. And they, we know they like counting objects, even if they're people or blocks or items. So um, we're going to give them more of that and help them build um, on those skills that need to be built up. And for others, they can learn to count more. So next slide. So looking at no and going deeper, we really want to help children develop those mathematical ideas and 
be able to express them naturally. So we take our learning environment and we just inundate it and flood it with tons of mathematical talk and concepts and encourage children to use math talk too. So we're talking about, we can tell them, you know, um, can you subitize how many objects are here? Um, and we teach them what subitizing is by looking at a small group of, num of items that are together. And they can just briefly look at it and say three, there's three there, how do you know? One, two, three. So we're using just daily activities that we're inundating the environment and our talk with children in a way that builds their, their number sense and quantity awareness and knowledge. So one idea we have is beginning and ending the day routines offer rich opportunities for math talk, like lining up, let's count the number of boys, let's count the number of girls, sorting classroom items like in the block area. How many rectangle blocks do we have? How many triangle blocks do we have? Taking attendance, and I love this one, we have eight boys here today and six girls. How many children in total? What is the sum total when we add them together? And it ends up being a, um, it ends up being a math operation. So another idea is to give children daily experience in counting and we do this with um, counting bears and we do it just um, with using cards and pattern recognition and using words like before, after, there's more than, less than, first, next, and last. So all of those words are reflect numeration and uh, quantity. So another idea is to, when we're outside or doing active, promoting, uh, promoting the use of various math words and math ideas, such as everybody make a circle. Let's line up and then again who what who came before what was after you know next triangle more fewer shorter longer and add and then at snack time that is another time or lunch time is another time to use those math language um, and even some advanced language concepts of shape, size, quantity, position, length, and volume can be introduced when cutting a sandwich, pouring a cup of juice, holding a paper plate, or merely counting at the table the number of crackers, raisins, or whatever. So next, As we look a little ahead here, shall we collect some ideas, Audra? Sure. Let me share to my whiteboard. We would like you to share with us some ideas you might have for simple math activities. And Audra will type them here on the whiteboard. You know, one that I used to enjoy was when I would tell, we would have, um, I would have the little ducks or little, um, any figurines and say, oh, three little ducks went, went out to play, but only two came back and then they, you know, we, they would leave one. So how many, you know, how many total came back? And then they would say two. So, uh, so it sounds like almost a subtraction problem, right? Mm -hmm. 
So they start with three, take away one. How many's left? Two. 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 Yeah. Two. Take away one. And you have one. So that's excellent. Vision. Plus, you said you use a concrete object, right? Right. So you have those concrete objects and the child can see. There's three, there's two, there's one. Because one went away, now there's two. So they're getting that whole operation Good job, buddy. of subtraction. And then also we, we, we will reverse it. Maybe in a couple of days we would say, oh, there was one, there was one little duck all by himself. Then another one came. How many, you know, so then we did the plus. The, so, yeah. Great. And that's good, Fina. Thank you so much for sharing. And Rosie Gutierrez says we use counting exercises where student have where students have to say how many more to make five, how many more to make ten. So, like, let's pretend you have three objects. How many more objects do we need to make five? That's really, really good. That's, and it's kind of, it helps with their abstract thought and their higher order thinking. They really have to exercise their brain when they do that. Any other ideas? At the high school level, what our teachers have been doing is using relevant examples for the students. So for example, if, if it's the financial algebra class, um, they start talking about um, interest on subsidized and unsubsidized student loans, um, interest rates on credit cards. If it is like um, integrated math one and they're going over some sort of um, geometry theorems or things along those lines, they now start talking about, okay, there's a football player, he's standing on this, you know, on the 45 yard line, needs to kick over here or shooting basketball. So the teachers try to find some sort of relevant examples to um, encourage the students to actively participate and to help make those connections that math actually pertains to the real world. In early mm -hmm. childhood ed education, we call those real life examples. And we find that as you, explain that children relate better to the material that way and it makes it like real for them oh like when i spend this much money on my credit card i by the time my payment comes i'm going to have to pay 91 cents more than what i paid initially so um, what do you mean really, that I don't have money? There's still checks in my checkbook. <laughs> right, exactly. So those, those kind of real life act activities are relevant. It's like very eye-opening and, and it's um, relevant. So, so I've and used, I- uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, sorry, go ahead, sorry. Jose. So I actually have used both in middle school and, and elementary, elementary, elementary. I started with that with um, back in the day, they were a craze of hot Cheetos and snacks. So I actually say, well, you're buying a box for a dollar, a bag for a dollar. So I would go to Sam's and buy the box of 25 and I'll give each one of the bags. I said, don't eat them. I said, uh, you're going to sell them. I said, I'll tell you how much it is. Let's just buy it. It costs 50. The price of the total box was $15. So I said, they buy $15 by 50, and they did the math. I said, now, whoever makes the most profit, so they're learning how to make profit, the cost, you know, so I'll see. So when you buy something, you can't just sell it for the same price because you don't make money. And I forgot what, if it was uh, percentages. Well, once the kids got that, they're like, oh my God, why do I pay a dollar for the bag of chips? When yes. I can make, you know? So now that I'm in uh, middle school and high school, I found this uh, um, new uh, program. Well, it's not new. It's called Blooklet. I don't know if you guys heard about it. It's B-L-O-K-E-T. So they have a cafe. Uh, how many of you guys are familiar with Kahoot? Yeah, we like Kahoot. Audra and well, I use this, Kahoot. Is that well, how you spell one, it? B-L-O-K-U-T? Uh, B-O-O, uh, B-L-O-O-E-T. So uh, you know how the students have to see the screen on Kahoot on the, for the questions? Yes. And have to choose the uh, boxes. Well, this one actually, when you share the link, 
the students get all the question and the boxes in front of them. But that's besides the point. They have one that's called uh, cafe. And what do you need to run a cafe? Well, you have customers, what do you need? Food. Well, they start with, uh, let's say, $9. So they have to answer the questions to go buy food. But now they have to make a decision. You have three customers. So now they have these critical thinking skills. If I buy this, I'm going to lose two customers. So they have to figure out what is profit, what's making. So it's uh, check, check it out, guys. But that's what I use now with my students because I actually made a connection to what I used to use in the class. I'm teaching them profit and making it relevant to life. Because if you teach just the math problem, the kids start to check out and they're like, why do I need to add fractions? Why do I need to do subtractions? But if you make it relevant, then they can make a better connection to it and they use it. Yes. And that real life, it's very teaching, not just the numbers, but socially. I mean, it's like, wow, why would I spend $3 to buy a bean burrito when I can go home and make it for 30 cents? You know, it's awesome. And yeah, yeah, those real life experiences are very telling, very teaching. And what a great strategy, right? To, um, To bring your subject to life. And Audra's putting in the chat box right now the presentation, the the actual uh, list we just made. Okay, Audra, would you like to um, talk about our video here? Yes, since we're showing you kind of a cycle of how we would do with math concepts, the one-to-one correspondence, we have a C, a portion for you, which is this video. So let me just make sure that I clicked the sound because I'm notorious for that. Okay, so we're gonna watch this video and be looking for um, just some of these different uh, ideas that we're talking about. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, seis, wow. Ahora en inglés, one, two, Three, four, five, six, six puppies. One, two, oh, good. Three, four, five, six. So uh, the C-section can be as easy as that, as simple as that, just a short video showing a provider educator how they can uh, do an activity within the context of their environment. And so that's kind of our going deeper with our C-section. And then go to the next one, there we go. And then we're gonna be going deeper with our SMART goal. And so um, with our um, SMART goal, Debbie, we're gonna lead us through this one. Okay, Um, so our SMART goal, during free choice time, use block building to do one-to-one correspondence or correlation two times a week with one child. Goal will be completed by 521. So that SMART goal is giving us it's time bound. So we're going to see if we've been successful in bringing children together to do this activity. And then the implementation steps choice to provide that one-to-one block counting and then um, add a book of ideas for block structures that use different amounts of blocks from a very simple counting up to complex. And that can be for different, you know, learners, different kinds of learners. And then we're going to add number cards to the block area and dots to show the number of in that the number in that block area and the card 
can be matched to the structure. Like this is a this is a 25 block structure. This is a four block structure. So they match the symbol to the uh, structure of uh, will give you the presentation so you can click <laughs> on these resources. This is where we got our material from today. We wanna give credit to these folks. The planning for no CDU um, and then the one-to-one -one correspondence stuff. This is the video we showed you. And then here's an article, it's a best practices article about math in our early learning and care environments. And so we wanted to share that with you too. Um, we just wanna say thank you for giving us the opportunity to present today. Do you have, anyone have questions that we need to, you'd like to um, have answered as we wrap up. No, it was awesome. I'm gonna use that resource because I'm trying to uh, plan for a summer school, a math summer school academy. Awesome. Well, we have found that no see do works very, very well. You know, we front load them with information, with, um, you know, with knowledge, we show them how it looks and then practice it. So it's, it's marvelous. And then we lather, rinse, and repeat. Yes, lather, <laughs> rinse, and repeat. Yes, thank you. And our contact information is there. So if you want to reach out to us at all, 